first few talks we have engaged with several important questions about the Bible in our It Is Written series. We asked why the Bible, what is the Bible, what is it for, where did it come from, and finally how do we read it. But now that we've begun to wrap our minds around those questions, we can begin to draw our focus to the actual scriptures themselves. So if you're new to Vineyard or missed any of this past series, go back and listen to our YouTube channel. It's a really great series. Today we are going to start to think and look at the story of the Bible. After all, that's exactly what this library that we call the Bible is. It's a story. The Bible is a library of writings that are both human and divine in origin, that together tell a unified story that leads us to Jesus. So for the next six weeks, we want to divide that narrative flow into six chapters. The first chapter that we're beginning today is creation. The kingdom begins. After that is the fall. The kingdom rebels against the king, followed by chapter three, Israel. The kingdom begins again. Chapter four is Jesus. The king comes with his kingdom. Chapter five is the church. The kingdom spreads to the world. And the grand finale is new creation. The king comes back to rule forever. So today we want to begin to explore the story of God, precisely where it begins, which is with God. You see, every good story has a hero or a heroine, and in the story of the Bible, God is the hero. So the context of this creation story, you know, have you ever missed the first episode of a TV series? I suppose it is a person of a certain age that remembers TV before iPlayer and other streaming services. You know, you spent the rest of the episodes trying to figure out what was going on. Who is that person? Why are they behaving that way? Who is that mystery person? You know, I also hate being late to the cinema. Nothing worse than missing the first five minutes of a film. Same set of problems. As human beings, we need context. We need to hear the start of a story understand the importance of future chapters. You know, to fully understand the story of God, we must understand the origin of the story, which we read in the pages of this collection of books we call the Bible. You know, just take the first four words we find in Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God. You know, we could spend the rest of this talk looking at these four words. So much theology and truth wrapped up in four words. In the beginning, God. Before anything else existed, God was there. God is before all things, outside of time and creation. You know, God existed before the story begins. Just let that sink in. God so majestic, so powerful, so divine. And then the next word, created, five words in. And we not only see the divinity of God, we see a key part of his nature. He is creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So sentence one in the great story of God, and we see that God created the universe. God created the heavens and the earth. Now it's worth noting that in the nine words we have now read, it doesn't tell us how he made them, it just said he did. Again, I could spend the rest of this talk, probably the rest of my life, trying to figure out how God did it. The fact of the matter is that we don't know the how, we just know the who. And this is such an important point to acknowledge. Genesis 1 and 2 are not a science textbook. They are the beginning of a story told to a particular people group at a particular time in history. Yes, we read it today and it tells us clearly that God made it all. But we must understand what we are reading and who it was written for. Anyone here watch Doctor Who? Well, I, am quite in, I quite enjoyed the last series. I love the way they introduced historical characters. In episode two, we met a lady called Ada Lovelace. Anyone heard of her? Well, it turns out she worked on what people believe to be the first ever computer, the analytical engine in 1837. She was a brilliant mathematician, an amazing machine. Could you imagine what she would think of a top of the range MacBook? Pro. Do you know what was invented in 1300 BC? Well, it's the abacus. Could you imagine what the people in China who invented the first abacus would think of the analytical engine, let alone the MacBook Pro? Okay, anyone know when Genesis was written? Well, 
it was around 1450 BC. So this book we are reading today is, an, is ancient. It was written 100 to 150 years before the abacus was even invented and a whopping 3000 years before the first telescope was made by Hans Lippershey. It was written to an ancient people whose science was also ancient. That's the context of Genesis 1. So as I read the next 10 verses, imagine you are sitting listening to Moses tell you the creation story for the first time, having received revelation from God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear and it was so God called the dry ground land and gathered and the gathered waters he called seas and God saw that it was good then God said let the land produce vegetation seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds and it was so the land produced vegetation plants bearing seed according to their kind and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark as sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so, God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living creature every living thing with which the waters teems and that moves around in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day and God said let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Are we ready for an ancient Hebrew science lesson? Well, let me introduce you to something called the firmament. This is what ancient Hebrews thought about the universe and, and the earth. You know, when Moses read them this story of creation for the first time, they understood it. It made sense to them. In fact, it talked about vaults, was not a problem to them at all. After all, it was written to them. God wasn't trying to give, an ancient, Hebrew, give ancient Hebrews a 21st century science lesson. Let's face it, we may have lots of things that we think we've got it all sorted and God's shaking his head saying, one day you'll get it. No, that's not the point of Genesis 1. It's the start of the story of God. Not only that, it's a poem. And there was evening and there was morning, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth day. 
Now, I've read all sorts of blogs and papers trying to dismiss the ancient Hebrew ideas from this ancient Hebrew text. Why? Because it doesn't fit with our 21st century science. You have people who say the Bible is wrong because everyone knows now that there is no vault in the sky. So the Bible is wrong. Well, that's just lazy theology, lazy reading of an ancient book. We then have those that read it literally rather than literarily. They read it as a science textbook that six days are six days. They explain away the inconsistencies with 21st century science and even treat modern theories as if they are conspiracy theories. Their heart on the whole is good. They believe God and are defending truth to a world that wants to treat the Bible as irrelevant. However, the problem is that it was never meant to be read this way. Its purpose was never to explain every nuance and process that led to the creation of all things. Wherever you land on the how, we must understand who it is written to. An ancient story to, an ancient, to ancient Hebrews with ancient science theory, and most important, why it was written. It might not be a science textbook, but it is a story full of truth. It is the start of God's story and introduces the main characters that we see throughout the pages of this great kingdom story. So firstly, we have God. In the beginning, God created. Then secondly, we have mankind, humanity. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In Genesis 2, we read a longer creation story. And we are introduced to Adam and Eve. You know, there is so much significance in their names. The name Adam or Adama means man or human. Potentially could be understood to mean humanity. Eve, derived from the Hebrew name Chawa, means to live or life. So in Adam and Eve, we, the names are powerful. We get the clear meaning of humanity lives or human life. I love that. Such meaning far beyond what we read in the literal. This wonderfully his, uh, holistic meaning of their names. And God is speaking to all humanity in this creation story. To you and I, yes, he is speaking firstly to ancient Hebrews, but universally to us all. See, God saw that he had God saw all that he had made and it was very good you know we read in the very first the first five days that it was good each plant fish animal was created each to its own kind however on the sixth day we read that humanity was made in God's own image we are different we reflect the image of God we are made in his likeness and God's creation of humanity was not just good but very good we are not just another creation in the creation story. Humanity was made to rule, to partner with God in the creation project. The first chapter is also not a history lesson. We are part of the story of God from the very beginning as, as we are also made in God's likeness and given authority to rule. And that is so important and I'm going to come back to that later. So firstly, God, secondly, humanity, and then thirdly, creation itself. The creation story sets the scene into which God creates humanity. God makes all this stuff, all these plants, animals, fish, ecosystems, climates, a healthy and vibrant planet full of such potential and scope for multiplication and life. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the, in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God gave humanity his creation to rule over, to subdue, bring order to the chaos, to multiply and be fruitful, to fill the earth. Did you notice that not everything in the, in the creation story, this side of the fall, was good? The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Helper is the same word attributed to God in some passages. What God had made was all good, in fact very good, however it was not complete. It was raw, unfinished, and that responsibility was given to humanity. We were given the job of subduing and filling the earth with order and life. And that leads me to my third and last aspect of the creation story I want to pick out. The job has not changed. The job has not changed. You know, all too often the church 
has started the story of God in Genesis 3 at the fall and ended at Revelation 20. The story starts with the rebellion and sin of humanity. The focus is then solely on salvation and the end is the judgment of all. However, that's not the full story of God. Of course, it's a significant theme that points to Jesus and of great importance, but it's not where the story starts. And it's not where the story ends. We have two chapters before the fall and two chapters after the final judgment, in which we see the call to rule, subdue and fill the earth. And then in Revelation 21, we see that there will be a new heaven and a new earth and the declaration of Jesus that I am making everything new. When we miss the first two chapters of Genesis, we don't see ourselves in the creation story, but rather see our story beginning at the fall. We miss so much of the call of God for our lives. You know, so much of the secular sacred divide is wrapped up in the fact that we have missed the first episode of the story. When the goal is salvation, when the mission is only seeking and saving the lost so that they might make it through the final judgment, we diminish any job that isn't leading to this end. You know, in some traditions we don't we see, don't we, you know, missionaries are held up as the prin pinnacle of the Christian mission and life. Full-time Christian work is the only work that is worth doing. Everything else is just tent making. This is the outworking of a diminished story of God that has trimmed the start and the end of the story. You see, when we understand that our authority to rule over creation, to subdue the earth, to bring order and life out of the chaos, we see that no matter where we are, what we do in this life, we can live out this calling everywhere and in every way. You know, if you are a builder, build beautiful buildings. If you are a farmer, steward the land as God would have you do it. If you work in finance, help people honour God with their finances. If you work in the NHS, which is obviously massively important this moment in time, show people love and compassion and work with Jesus to bring healing and life. If you are a teacher, help the next generation discover their God-given design and destiny. If you are, and fill in the gap, do it in the authority you've been given, unleashing the values and purpose of the kingdom every day in your life. You see, every job, whether paid or not, has the potential to join Jesus in the renewal of all things, to obey God's command to rule, subdue and bring life to all creation. Let me finish with this. We all have a choice as to whether we abuse the earth or steward it, whether we treat it with honour as the good creation of our all-powerful God or as a resource to be exploited for our own gratification. You know, this year the Arctic has recorded the highest ever summer temperatures, 20 plus degrees centigrade, and across the year the average temperature is up 3 degrees centigrade. Thousands of species are becoming extinct. We are destroying ecosystems and rare environments such as the rainforest. We are filling the oceans with plastic, and I could go on. The call, even the command of God in Genesis 1 and 2 is to subdue, rule with wisdom and kingdom mentality, and to fill the earth with order and life. We have to care for our environment. This is not some liberal agenda. It is the fundamental commission of God on all humanity. We all have to play our part. We can't fully bring glory and honour to God if we ignore his command to steward the earth and all that's in it. Partnering with Jesus in the renewal of all things is not a new tagline. It's the ancient call of God to men and women, made in his image, that we would take his authority and partner with Jesus in revealing God's initial design and purpose for his astonishing creation. Unleashing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven is far more than healing the sick, setting the captives free and seeking and saving the lost. However, they are all wonderful. Unleashing the kingdom also is also coming into alignment with our original call and commission to steward the earth and bring life and God's design to every nook and cranny of creation. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the creation story. I thank you so much that you tell us so much about how um, you want us to live in the earth, what our role is, what our call is, what we're commissioned to do. 
I thank you that you put yourself at the start of the story, even before the story. Lord, would you help us to remember how majestic and wonderful you are? Lord, would you help us to understand that we are part of the story? We don't stand separated. We don't look on the story as, a, as an observer. We are a participator in the story of God, in the story of the Bible, in the story of creation. So help us to play our part in bringing life, in the, bringing the renewal of all things, in stewarding the earth. I thank you for just your honesty and your openness and the way you share your truth with us through your word. Help us to understand what it is we read and what it is you are saying to us. Bless us as we keep looking at the next five chapters in your great narrative. May we have a better understanding of your story as we continue to study and look at your word in this way. Amen. Thank you.